All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Yeah. Welcome to our locations, everybody online. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jared, by the way. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor, these wonderful people known as Grace. So a special welcome to you all, especially our guests. We're in a series called Experiencing God, and we are actually landing the series today. And then next week, we're jumping into a marriage. A marriage. <laughs> Hope you're not jumping into a marriage. <laughs> Next week, we're jumping into a new series on relationships. We'll deal with marriage, of course. I hope you will come back for that. But today, good word for us. Let me pray, and we will dig in. Lord, thank you for all who are gathered at this time, this early hour. And I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, our guide, our comforter, our counselor. And I pray for anyone in this room, in our rooms, across our campuses and online, across the country, I pray today that your spirit will speak a special word for every name under the sound of my voice, to every specific heart. May they have met with God today and hear his voice. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I think I've told this in the past, but I remember this story years and years and years ago about this pastor who was before his people, and he just walked out on stage with the music playing, and he just stopped, and he raised his hands, and he went, yes, and then the music kind of died down, and everybody was watching him, and he said, yes, again, and then all of a sudden, the music started coming up, and everybody in the congregation started joining him, yes, yes, they just kept saying, yes, 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 and then it got really quiet, and he said this, he goes, that's our answer, Lord, now just tell us what you want us to do, Amen. and so that's my heart for you. That's my heart for me and my family is that we would come before the Lord with a yes. Now just tell me what you want me to do. God, move in me, move in my life, and my prayer is that God will move in yours. So that's been where we've been with experiencing God, experiencing God and how he invites us to join him in what he's doing, how he can speak to us. We talked about that last week, how he seeks you first in relationship and love with you, and then in response to his first love for us, to, to then love him first in our lives and to experience his work in our lives and what he does within our hearts and also what he does through our lives. And that's what we're talking about today is our yes to God in the sense that he wants to move in you, but also move through you. So as we land our series today, the question is, if you're saying yes to any degree in your life, you're saying, yes, God, move through me, what will happen in your life if you pray that today? I mean, what, what do you need to brace yourself to face if you say, yes, Lord, tell me what you want me to do? I see this in a few ways. First of all, if you pray God moves in your life, it's going to involve a crisis, specifically a faith crisis. Now, don't think a calamity. Don't think if God's going to move my life, move in my life, I got to go through a calamity. I mean, maybe, but hopefully not. It's a different kind of crisis. It's a it's a faith crisis in the sense that if you hear Him in His inv- invitation to work and move in you, then to work and move through you, you're going to come to a place of decision where you've got to trust God to do what only He can do. And that's the crisis. If you, with a yes, step out, only he can provide. Only he can accomplish. Only he can do it through you. So you are completely at his mercy to move in you and to provide for you and to give you the divine enablement to carry out whatever he has in your life. But that is exactly where you will experience God. So we're back to Moses And again, a lot of this teaching has been adapted from a a, a study I did 30-something years ago called Experiencing God that kind of defined my life and ended up where I am today. And we see this chiefly with Moses. So Moses, if you've been here the last few weeks, he, uh, long story short, God spoke to him through the burning bush and gave him a mission. He said, God, he said, Moses, I want to move through you, but it's going to involve a faith crisis. So God comes to him and he says in Exodus chapter three, so go Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, and here comes the crisis, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? 
And God said, I will be with you. So who am I? You've got the wrong person. This is going to be embarrassing. I've never done anything like this before. This is way outside my pay grade. I don't have these gifts or these abilities, Lord. Faith crisis. And we see him go next level in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. He, Moses cranks up again. Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh, Lord, I am not very good with words. I have never been, and I am not now. And even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Anybody? I'd do that with my own marriage. I get tongue-tied, much less try to get up here and preach to you at 8.30 in the morning. It's rough. Got to have my caffeine. But God said, now go, I will be with you. Second time, he said, I will be with you. Now go, I will be with you as you speak. And I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please, no. Send someone else. So Moses is not saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. He's going, no, Lord, no, Lord. But I love how even here in verse 12, it says, now go, I will be with you as you speak. In the original language, it literally means I will be with your mouth. I will be with you specifically in the place you're afraid to trust me. So the Lord will be with your mouth. If you don't think you have the personality, the Lord will be with your personality. If you don't feel like you're sharp enough in your mind, the Lord will be with your mind. The Lord will be with you very practical, in very practical ways. But you gotta trust him in the crisis, the trust crisis of the moment of what you're going to do. So God already knew what he was going to do. He was going to deliver his people whether Moses was going to join him or not. Just like God's going to do his thing whether you join him or not, whether I join him or not. He will do it with someone else. But he pursued Moses, and we see he's, in a sense, inviting Moses just like the Lord will always be inviting you to join him because he wants you to experience him and his power in relationship with him and what he wants to do and what will what will determine what you do in the faith crisis it, it, let me see how I can say it reveals what you truly believe about God so let me say it again what you determine to do in that moment in a faith crisis will reveal what you truly believe about God. So if you reach the moment and you say, oh, my mouth, oh, my, I get tongue-tied, or I'm, you know, I'm not that funny, or I can't think quick on my feet, or I'm not a, I wasn't very good in school, or whatever it is you do, in that moment, it will determine how you view God if you hold back. Because if we hold back, we're saying, God, you're not enough, or you won't truly be with me. So to believe in through the crisis is to say, I'm all in. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to believe. But it's that moment, that moment. And I wonder if you're in that moment right now, somewhere in your life. You're, you're in that pause place of a faith crisis of what God may be leading you to do and how he wants to move through you. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we, for we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith, not by sight. Because many people think faith is, I place my faith in Jesus, I trust Jesus Christ for my salvation and made right before God and with him forever, and now I just got to behave and get to heaven. No, we live by faith. In other words, we live by trust in the Lord, in the practical areas of our lives. We, we please the Lord through daily faith, not just a moment of faith. Listen to this. This is what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. Now, it's just not faith for salvation. Hebrews 11 is all about those who lived by faith. You live by faith every day of your life. That's the call. That's the risk. That's why you ought to be having a few faith crises in your life as you live and as I live. Without, now listen, it doesn't say without faith it's impossible to be pleasing to God. Oh, you're pleasing to God because of what Christ has done for you. That's over. That's done. You are a child. You are adored and you are loved. That's great news because now you can please your dad. You can please your father. By living by faith and trusting in him in ways that defies often your own thinking. So let me ask you some 
practical questions. What are you attempting right now in which you will only succeed if God does it? Where have you stepped out in faith right now? And you're a goner unless God shows up. And if you don't have anything like that in your life, mm -mm. What, is about, what does that say about your view of God? I don't mean to make anybody feel guilty today. That's not my heart. But I do want us to be convicted. Because if we're not convicted to take God at his word, we're not going to experience his presence and his miracle ways of using you and providing for you. Are you someone that's like I often tend to be? Once I've got the money straight, once I have the resources in order, once I've got it all locked in, now I'm ready to step out in faith. That's not faith. So what does it mean for you? What, what, what are the chief causes of you lacking faith right now? Is it finances? Is it education? Or life, your life stage? Once my kids are grown or once I pay off their college? Could it be that? Is it fear? You just have a, a fear in your heart. And fear can often come through past experiences with parents or issues in your life or maybe even places in your life that I've been where you felt like God didn't show up. I've been there too. But when I look back, I go, oh, he did show up. But he showed up in a way that he had to teach me a few things first. And it's therefore stirred up my faith even today. So it could be that. It could be fear. It could be confidence. It could be that you have a lack of support, feel like you have a lack of support around you or in front of you. But again, whatever that could be in your life that stops you short in a faith crisis, pray about that. Lord, I'm fearful around my finances. Help me. I want to say yes, whatever it is, regardless of finances, because I know you're a good God and you'll provide. Pray about those specific things. Let me ask another question for you. What has God invited you to do, but you haven't because of lack of faith? I tell my kids this because it helps me to remind me as I share this with my kids. Whenever you make a decision, whenever you come to a place where there's a bit of fear involved or faith involved, before you make the decision, ask yourself this question. Am I about to make this decision based on fear or based on faith? Am I about to make this decision based on fear or based on faith? Start there because there reveals the faith crisis and then what you truly believe about God. But then pray it to the Lord and let him do a work in you. So if you want God to move through you and experience his presence, you're going to face a faith crisis. It's part of the deal. We see it in scripture with even more I could have shared, but we see it here with Moses. The second way that you're going to experience God or what, what, when you're, you're gonna, what you're going to face when God wants to move in your life is not only a faith crisis, but a life adjustment, a life adjustment. And that's the fear, really, is what it's going to call out of you and call out of me of where the Lord wants to move us in a different direction. So a life adjustment. I've learned many, many of us want the assignment from God so we can experience him, but we're reluctant on the adjustment we need to make before God. So we're like, Lord, <laughs> I just want to experience you right here. Just teach me and, and let me experience your presence and, uh, you know, the adjustment. Let me pray about it, and it'll come in time. Well, we get stuck in that place. When you look at Scripture, you will see that you cannot stay where you are and go with God. So you look at Moses. Moses could have stayed in Midian, shepherding his sheep, and had belief in God and ended up ended his days just like that. But how sad would that have been that he just existed and he believed in God and he died? But instead, he faced a faith crisis and he stepped through and experienced the miracles of God in and through his life because he made a faith adjustment. Adjustment. He had to leave the wilderness with his sheep in Midian and go to Egypt. You cannot stay where you are and go with God. Also, we see with Noah. I mean, even if you're not a believer and you're joining us, and I'm so thankful you're here, keep coming back, keep asking questions. But you've heard of Noah. 
Noah had to build an ark. That meant he had to go from where he was to go where God told him. So he had to make some shifts and changes in his life in order to build this ark. You have the disciples in the New Testament, Peter, Andrew, Peter, Andrew, James. Jesus said, come and follow me. They left the family business to go follow Jesus. Now, they could have stayed in the family business and been a believer in Jesus. But instead, they trusted face-to-faith crisis of a decision and followed him and experienced the miracles that he did and witnessed his resurrection, y'all. And even Jesus, even Jesus himself, the ultimate adjustment, did he not? 2 Corinthians 5, no, 2 Corinthians 8, he who was rich became poor in order to make us who are poor, spiritually poor, rich in Christ. So we see this as the theme all throughout Scripture, that you cannot stay where you are and go with God. That's why life is living by faith. God is always inviting you every day. He's not hanging back, waiting for the moment to go, I invite you to this. No, every day he's going, I invite you. I invite you. Join me here. Join me here. And that's why we spent three weeks talking about a relationship with God. Last week, hearing God, hearing how he might speak to you so you can discern if it's your voice or his voice. So what kind of adjustments might God call you to make in your life? Here are a few circumstances. Maybe it's around your job. Maybe it's around your finances where you live. Maybe it's relationships regarding family and friends and colleagues. Maybe it's in your own thinking about your own abilities or lack of abilities, your plans you've made, goals you have, methods of how you're reaching those goals. Maybe he wants you to adjust that to him. Or it could be commitments, traditions you hold on to, your current job or career, location in which you live. That could be it. Or the school in which you attend. That could be it. Beliefs. God may be calling you to adjust your beliefs about him, that he's more than a religion, it's relationship, and it means, he means a lot more than just believing in him, but having faith, trust in him to live by faith every day in your financial life, in your family life, in your career life, in your future life, and provision. Maybe it's around beliefs in God and trusting him, having relationship with him. I've had people ask me over the years, Well, actually, it wasn't a question. It was more a statement. I'm afraid, I'm going to put this in my words. I'm afraid to fully give myself to Jesus because of what it might cost me. Anybody like that this morning? Now, be real. Anything in you that says, what pastor is preaching right now? Mm Mm-mm. Because what will it mean if I go to the Lord and go, yes, 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 just tell me what you want me to do. And listen, if there's anything in you, I got that in me, and I'm your pastor, where I'm going, "Mm, no, I want to, Lord, but, mm," you know, what is that in your life? You know what it means then, just making it a little more practical to today, Jesus is Lord. He's Lord whether he's Lord over you or not. But he's to be Lord over your life, which you give your life, you surrender your life. So here's a question. Is there any area in your life that you refuse to let Jesus be Lord? It's really easy for Jesus to be Savior. I'm made right with God. I believe in him. I'm going to try to live a good life, treat my family well and be a good person. And we have all these things that we come to church once a week or once a month or whatever that looks like. And we tell ourselves these things, but no, no, no. What area of your life, financial life, relational life, personal life, secret life, what is it in your life where you have refused Jesus to be Lord? Because you know something, that's probably where he's going to start. That's probably the area he's going to focus in on. And you'll know what that area is. If there's any sense of you walking with the Lord, you'll know what that area is, especially when you start to pray. And it just jumps right up in your mind. And you kind of put it aside, I'll deal with that later. And you pray and you say, God help me and God provide for me and God do for me. And God's over here talking like, "Mm mm-mm. He just keeps touching that area in your life where he's not Lord. He wants to move there first. 
That's why you can't go where God is because you're stuck in that one area. We all have areas in certain degrees, and that's why we always come before, come before him believing rightly about him. That where he, where he is to be Lord is where you find your freedom, where you find his glory, where you find your joy, and where you find others good. Is he Lord of your life? Every, every area of your life. And it takes that place specifically to, to which to have a life adjustment. Let me keep pushing that a little bit. Watch what Jesus says in Luke 14, 33. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Now, if you read that like me, at times I go, well, he doesn't mean everything. He doesn't mean I just leave up, leave everything. What he's saying is, is I want everything. And to live your life like this, not like this. And whatever you have in your life that's like this, he's not Lord. So he says we live our lives ready to say yes, yes, everything I own. Yes, yes for whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to be, the answer is yes, to give it all up, to move. It, it goes on to show us that to move forward, sometimes you got to leave something behind. I was thinking, but I was studying this this week and sweating it out, all right, for you. You know the singer Meatloaf? Have you heard of this singer, the Meatloaf? I, I just, you can't forget a singer by the name of Meatloaf. I don't know if that dates me or if everybody knows who I'm talking about, but there was this singer actually named Meatloaf, all right? I think, I think he passed away, but he had this song. You know, if you, if, you're, if you know Meatloaf, you know this song. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. That is literally the refrain of the song. I will do, it makes no sense. If you listen to the song, I love you, I love you, I'll give anything, but I won't do that. How many of us are that way with Jesus? Amen. I will do anything for love, but I won't give up that. But I won't do that. I won't go there. Mm. Anybody as convicted as I am today? Amen. And I got to preach this. Amen. Now, is God doing this to make you miserable? Is that his goal? He wants you to say yes so he can make your life miserable. God's not after making you miserable. He's after being your Lord. And when you trust him in these areas is where you'll experience his joy, Amen. his glory, his goodness, and you'll experience the grace for where you fall short. Grace is simply divine enablement. Divine enablement to do what he's calling you to do and to provide what he will provide. So God loves you and any adjustment he calls you to make that seems painful or restrictive or scary, it's always for your good and my good and his glory and others' joy. It's just how it works with him. And here's the greatest help of all to me. It's spoken twice, and I've already showed it to you in scripture. It's spoken twice to Moses, where Moses in a faith crisis and Moses in a life adjustment God said this to him, Exodus 3.12 and 4.12, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with your mouth. <laughs> I will be with every part of you. I will be with your finances. I will be with your relationships. I will be with the move you're going to make. I will be with you. So I love reading leadership to help me understand and, and, and do well as your pastor. And, and you know, over the years as I've read the scriptures looking at prophets and people in scripture regarding their leadership strengths, their leadership prowess, their leadership accomplishments. You know what I found to be the chief secret of their lives? God is with them. God is with them. Every time God is with them, I will be with you. That's the secret sauce in the faith crisis. It's the secret sauce in the life adjustment. He will be with you. A third way here that God will move in your life and what it will involve when you say yes is this, full obedience. Full obedience. This is the moment of truth. 
about what you really believe. Full obedience, full obedience. Hebrews 3.15, the scriptures say, if you hear his voice today, don't be stubborn like those who rebelled. Don't be stubborn like those who disobeyed. What's one act today in which you could obey God? What's one place today, after hearing what I've been preaching here over the last little while, what, what's one act today that's, that's touched you to say, right there, I must obey, because I've heard it today. God spoke through pastor the word today, and this is the one thing I know to obey him in. So when you think of God moving and involving you in his work, we're called to fully obey. And so what you can fully obey, if you're really wrestling with what that is in, in terms of being invited to his work, is obey what you already know God wants you to do. Start with the Ten Commandments. Start right there. That's how you join God. Full obedience there. Then think about how there's a big deal on forgiving others and not holding grudges. Right there is a, a, an area to obey. Joining God, inviting you by that one step to forgive others or Think about your marriage as we get into this next week. Husbands, love your wives and give yourself up for her as Christ died for the church. Right there is a step of obedience. Ladies, to respect your husbands. That's a step of obedience, which you already know to do in these one, this one area, perhaps. And there could be other specifics in your lives. But the thing we got to understand is that God does not let us pick and choose what commandments to obey. Because you know what? If I got to choose commandments I could obey and not obey, here'd be mine. Don't murder. Got it. <laughs> Done. No, it goes a little further. And remember, fully obeying is where you experience him fully. And his joy and his goodness and his freedom. All his commands are designed to bless and protect. He says in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23, to the people after he delivered them from Egypt, he said, obey my words and all will go well for you. We talked about the commands last week, how commands are love for God, his love for us to protect us from running out into the street and get ourselves hurt. He commands us to stay out of the street like we do our kids. Don't run out of the street. I command you not to. That's a beautiful, wonderful thing that God would do for us as it is for a parent to a child. Keep close, keeps us from self-destructing. So it's to fully obey. Now, when you, as we zoomed out, and let me zoom in a little more here, or actually let me zoom out a little more here. If you're wrestling with and can't quite get your head around or your heart around or clarity around where God may be leading you to a, a, a risk, a, a work for him, he's inviting you. It could be that your current level of obedience does not match the next level of the work he wants to do with you. So therefore, the doors stay closed or therefore, things aren't clear. Or therefore, you're still wondering why God and you're waiting because you're, where you are with God right now can't carry you with where he wants to take you. And so there are places in your life and mine we got to go within and see what's that one area. Just start with the one area, the one command we know to do. Oh, or it could be this. It could be the other extreme. Maybe you're looking at your life and you're going, but pastor, I pray, I walk with the Lord, I repent. The best I know how, I, I really believe I do all I can to be right with him and to walk close with him. And it's, and pastor, here's just what I need. I'm, I'm, the reason I'm stuck is if, if God would just give me a sign. That's me. Oh, God, give me a sign. Now, when I was single, it was easier. Give me a sign, God. Give me something. And it was a, I'm not saying it was easy. I'm saying it was a little easier because if things went wrong, <laughs> it would just impact me. But for those of us, you know, you have families, we have four kids and all that. And you're, you really want to know before you make extreme adjustments and obedience to God that you believe 80%, you believe it's in 60. It's always, for me, it's always between 60 and 80%. O only about five times in my life has it been 100%. So right there in the, that area, you're like, oh, God, it, but my kids and my wife and, you know, this and that, and just give me a sign. 
But then I go to scripture and I see how God dealt with signs. So when God called Moses to go to his people, he actually did give Moses a sign for him to his people. Take the, take the cane, throw it down on the ground, it'll become a snake. Take your hand, put it in your cloak, pull it out, it'll have leprosy. That was a sign to his people. But he did not give Moses a sign that would assure Moses that he would deliver God's people. That one he didn't give him. Matter of fact, it was stronger than that. Watch this, what he says to Moses. And God said, Moses, when you go to deliver my people, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. He just said the sign is going to come after you obey. That's when I don't go, yes, yes. That's when I go, no, no. That's backward, Lord. I need it before I obey. I don't need it after I obey, but that's not how he works. Let me show you another area. This is Joshua, who was Moses' protege. Moses mentored Joshua. Moses has passed away. Joshua's picked up his mantle, and he's leading God's people. Watch this. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest, Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from the upstream stopped flowing. Okay, I would be like, okay, Lord, when I walk to the water's edge, I expect the flood stage to stop and the water to go down a little bit, and then I'll put my feet in. No, no, he's saying, while the water is at flood stage, put your feet in it. That's the sign that comes after the obedience. I mean, and then think about, they, they could have waited. They could have, they could have walked up to, the, to the Jericho at flood stage and came back and Joshua got in everybody and said, listen, we're just going to pray and we're just going to keep praying for the next few months until the flood stage is over. And then we'll know God wants us to go. That's how I would work. But no, he's saying in the middle of the flood stage, put your feet in there. And then you'll see the sign that I sent you. Amazing. So be careful that you're looking for a sign before you obey because we see in Scripture, typically it comes afterward. Okay, one more. The disciples, Luke chapter 10. Jesus is sending his people into the town to share the hope of Christ and to heal. And he says to them, when you, when you go, don't take any money, don't take any belongings, don't even take any shoes, and go. Now, I'm not wired like that. I need money when I go, and I need my belongings to go with me in case I spill Kool-Aid on me, and I want my shoes in case, it, in case I want to go hiking. I need my boots in case I want to go for a run. I wear my sneakers. You know what I'm saying? I want to go ready. Jesus said, no, no. I want you to trust me and go. And what happened? God showed up. They came back and rejoiced. And so that's when we'll rejoice, when we obey, trusting God will follow up with the sign to come. So that's what happens when you say yes. You're going to face a faith, faith, faith crisis, a life adjustment, and full obedience. And then we land, land it right here. This is the way we began the series, and this is the way I want to land the series. That when you say yes to the Lord and you face the faith crisis, life adjustment, full obedience, remember all of that. It's founded on and it rests on your intimate love relationship with God, Amen. period. Amen. Everything overflows from that love. If you're seeking to walk in an intimate love of relationship with God daily, trust that you're right in the middle of his will daily and that he's leading you and guiding you. The gospel of Jesus came and he died on the cross for your sin and he rose from the dead on the third day and ascended to the right hand of the Father where he reigns today. When you place your faith in him, he in puts his indwelling Holy Spirit within you. All of that is his love, the gospel. And we see then that even in that way, what he did with Moses, he first loved you, 1 John 4, 10. This is love, not that we loved him, but he loved us. Gave his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. So he's always the first loving one. And then giving us his Holy Spirit, we are then to walk in this, that's how intimate he is with us, that he gives us himself within ourselves to now walk in relationship with him in total dependence on him. 
That's why you know whenever you face the faith crisis and life adjustment, you don't face it as an orphan. You face it with the Holy Spirit within you and then God with you. And then that means that whatever he's called you to do that's outside of yourself and you say, but, but I can't and I don't and I've never, you can trust that this is what Jesus says. I am the vine, you are the branches. <clears throat> if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. <clears throat> so it's a relationship now. You continue on that's God-centered. It's saying, Lord Jesus, anything you want. Here's my checkbook. Here's my signature. You put whatever you want on there. For my life, for whatever you have, I am saying yes. And I depend on you to provide in every way and, and depend on you to do everything for me. Because of this love relationship that we share. Right now, our kids are at the age. We're starting to talk about college. We have one graduating this year. And so there's conversations around colleges and what college to apply to and what am I going to do with my life and what's my career. And something I try to remind them over and over again is, listen, God's not about showing you his job description. He's about his love relationship with you. So don't start with what's the college I'm going to go to or what's the career God has for me. Don't start there. Start with him. Am I close to him? Am I walking with him? Am I praying to him? Am I in the word to him? Am I in love with him? That's the power, and that's where God's going to lead you from. I came across this story <clears throat> of a couple of Olympic ice dancers by the name of Virtue and Scott Moyer. Moyer, Moyer. Virtue and Scott Moyer. It's interesting about how they prepare to dance. Before they go out on the ice to dance, they embrace each other and they hold each other so that their heartbeats can begin to sync with one another. And then their breathing begins to sync with one another. And then when they go out on the ice, they are in sync with each other because everything else is. Oh, come on, y'all. That's what it means to live in relationship with the Lord. You spend time with him. You match your heartbeat to his heartbeat. You, you embrace him and you stay so close to him that your breath is with his breath in this intimate relationship. And then when you, you know he moves in your life, here comes the faith crisis. Here comes the life adjustment. Here comes the, the, the call to obedience. You're, you're, you're walking with him and you're moved then to, to take that step more and more and more in such a way because of this love relationship. And it's from that love relationship that you start with, yes, yes, yes. Now just tell me what you want me to do. Amen. That's my message. Praise God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, grateful for all who are gathered. And <clears throat> I know there was a little something in this for all of us this morning. And so I pray that today that we hear your voice, we would not harden our hearts. <clears throat> I pray, God, more than anything else in terms of you moving, that you will move in such a way that it always comes back to our, our love relationship with you, matching heartbeat to heartbeat with you, <clears throat> following you, living for you, and trusting you. That out of that, when the faith crisis comes because of an invitation to join you or a life adjustment comes or a touch where we're not obedient, that we will, in that moment, open our hearts to give them fully to you again, knowing that when we say yes, 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 you will move, you will guide, you will enable, you will provide, and we will experience you. To you be the glory, Jesus, it's all about you. And I pray it all in your name, amen. Amen. <laughs>